Uh, my name is Jeremy Cousin. I'm an assistant professor uh, of applied mathematics at uh, the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Uh, I was formerly a postdoc at uh, Stanford University in the Department of Geophysics, and uh, today we're going to talk about work that I did uh, while in that position. Certainly that was uh, part of it. I did grow up in uh, the Bay Area, so I remember sort of the big earthquake in 89 that caused uh, all the devastation during the uh, World Series that year, and uh, during, you know, Bay Bridge collapse and things like that. And I remember, you know, being in elementary school at the time and sort of feeling that and uh, experiencing that. And so that definitely heightened my interest in, in earthquakes at the time. And uh, I think also <clears throat> sort of when I finished my PhD, I realized that, you know, earthquakes and earth sciences in general sort of are a rich area for applied math and computational math. And that you can have a real impact uh, in that field, um, sort of applying a number of the techniques that uh, we sort of, I've applied across the board in general in applied math. So when we talk about modeling an earthquake, we could mean several different things. We could sort of mean talking about the hazard associated with a with a fault zone. So you may want to say, you know, produce insurance rates or a hazard map for uh, where you live. But we can also talk about what's known as scenario earthquake simulation. And scenario earthquake simulation, we're not sort of trying to directly sort of characterize everything that could happen, but we want to say, well, given an event that might happen, sort of what would be the effects of that? And so you may sort of want to know sort of what are, how are the waves going to resonate in, say, the LA Basin or uh, in Hayward, um, which is a, a city in the Bay Area. And, you know, you may want to say, how, well, how are the waves going to be affected by the the earth properties and these sorts of things. Um, so there's that sort of earthquake modeling. What we do is similar to that. We've been doing something known as dynamic rupture modeling. And in that dynamic rupture modeling, we actually model uh, the fault response as well as the waves that are propagating away from the fault. So when an earthquake happens, you have waves that are carrying uh, perturbations and velocity and stress uh, out from the fault. But these waves travel out and they actually feed back into the interface itself. And so the interface is governed by friction laws, and these friction laws are, are highly nonlinear. They're, the nonlinearity is related to the velocities and the stresses and the discontinuity in the velocities uh, at the fault, and sort of we want to model sort of what happens uh, at that level. And so that we sort of are informed by experiments that happen at places like the USGS and some laboratories in uh, Europe where they sort of do these high-speed high speed friction experiments, and they sort of slide two pieces of rock um, with respect to one another and they sort of model or they sort of measure, I shouldn't say model, they sort of measure how the fault is responding. And when we say these rocks are sliding past each other, we're talking meters per second displacement velocities. So quite fast. Linking between the laboratory scale and the field scale is definitely a challenge uh, in earthquake modeling. Sort of how do you take those laboratory experiments that maybe happen on a piece of rock that's, you know, centimeters across and scale that up to something that's happening uh, over, you know, a hundred of hundreds of kilometer fault. Um, and so making those connections between the two is something that is a challenge within the community. Uh, right now, one of the things that we're pursuing as uh, with or that I'm pursuing with some of my collaborators is sort of beginning to use adaptive mesh refinement techniques to sort of ask, well, what happens when we lose those scales? So, you know, maybe when we simulate something as large as the earthquake that happened in Japan, you know, maybe we really can't put in those laboratory measured parameters, which would require us to put meter millimeter resolution uh, on the fault zone. But we can maybe idealize some some earthquakes and maybe look at a, a much simpler geometry and ask what's going to happen in that case and sort of try to build uh, upscaled constitutive models that capture the important physics and allow us to uh, simulate at these larger scales on available resources but still sort of trust what's coming out. So the uh, earthquake in Japan, uh, the Tohoku earthquake or the Great East Japan earthquake, occurred on what was known as a subduction zone. So subduction zones are where one plate is sort of going underneath another. And these are typically where the largest earthquakes occur. They're also sort of where the most hazard for tsunami comes from. So one of the big things that we were sort of seeking to explore with our models was sort of why did the tsunami occur? And the tsunami occurred because there was a, well, one of the reasons the tsunami occurred was there was a large amount of seafloor uplift. Um, and this large seafloor uplift was caused by sort of a large amount of slip right at the trench. So that means sort of how much the fault got displaced uh, right at the trench. And so to give you a sense of the scale of displacements we're talking about, uh, 
some people have projected up to 80 meters of displacement of the trench. Now, I think that's probably sort of the outer bound, uh, the upper bound, but I think sort of the large consensus at this point is there was definitely tens of meters of slip right at the seafloor. So that means sort of right at where the, the fault meets the seafloor, there was tens of meters of displacement. Um, so, sev you know, sort of equivalent to a several story building um, amount of displacement. Now, this obviously causes a large seafloor uplift. Now, this was sort of really surprising uh, to scientists and to the sort of uh, earthquake community at large because it was sort of believed that that top section of the fault wouldn't actually slip during a large earthquake, that there just wasn't the energy there. The energy balance was sort of believed not to work out. Um, and sort of what we were able to show with our models is that even if we put in the assumption that there's not energy to release on that segment of the fault, that if you sort of neglect the dynamics of what's going on, because you have wave energy sort of being released from deep slip on the fault that comes up to the seafloor, it gets re reflected off the seafloor and it gets channeled onto that top portion of the fault, sort of driving the rupture through that region. Certainly, I mean, really what you're getting at the heart at is how do we set up the initial conditions for these things? How do we, you know, we can't take measurements of sort of what the state of stress is in the earth. We don't actually, um, you know, whereas a building contractor, when they build a house or they build a you know, a skyscraper, they know exactly what the stresses are. They know exactly what the forces that are in operation here. And the Earth, we don't know. You know, we can maybe get some sense sort of in the near surface region, but sort of deep down where these earthquakes happen, you know, kilometers deep, uh, we don't really have a sense for that. So what we have to do is we have to sort of guess. And we, we have to guess using our best intuition, using expert uh, advice, but that also means that we don't want to just trust our guesses and we don't want to just trust our assumptions, but we want to do not just a single earthquake simulation, but we want to do a, a multitude or an ensemble of simulations to really understand how the uncertainties in our understanding of the physics and our uncertainties in the understanding of the initial conditions uh, affects the final result. Right. I mean, I think it was uh, when we first got involved in this project, it was actually um, soon after the earthquake had happened. Um, you know, we'd obviously been talking about it within our group, but we always sort of said, well, you know what, our codes aren't really set up to do these large scale simulations. I mean, we had a big parallel code, but we'd sort of only really used it on sort of simplified geometries. And, you know, uh, you know, I was in the midst of writing up the method for publication and uh, another scientist actually um, Emily Brodsky from UC Santa Cruz approached our research group and said, hey, you know what, we're talking about drilling across the fault. We want to drill and we want to take measurements. And we think that the methods that you guys have been developing um, can help us do that and can help us do that in the sense of sort of help us to sort of say, well, what do we expect to see? And if we see various things, what is that going to mean? And so being approached about that, I think, was sort of a proud moment for me being part of the research group that was approached. It certainly, um, you know, was a team effort uh, there. It was me and Eric and various other people that had helped develop the method. Um, but that was sort of a proud moment. And then actually seeing our code do the simulation, sort of putting in an extremely complicated, extremely challenging uh, geometry for this to occur on. Um, you know, we have extremely small angles. This makes it a very difficult problem uh, to simulate, but actually seeing the code do it and then seeing the community look at the results and be excited about them alongside of us. And that was sort of, that was exciting to see. It was something that sort of, um, you know, I've had a few moments like that in my career and to have other people sort of want to get your results and want to talk about your results and invite you to come talk about the results um, and to begin to see it, you know, just, you know, multi-million dollar project to drill across the fault zone happened in a small part, very, very, very small part, um, because of some of the simulations that we were able to do and contribute to that effort. Um, and so that, that was really exciting. So the largest embarrassment, I would say personally, um, or I wouldn't say necessarily embarrassment, but sort of one of the silliest things that I did um, was sort of when we were bringing the model into our into our code, we sort of, you know, took some data that was published um, to give us the geometry, you know, sort of the rock properties and, and all this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, and the geometry itself. So sort of what angles the fault dipping at, sort of where all the various material layers. Uh, and I hadn't read the caption that we'd pulled the, the geometry from uh, correctly, and I didn't realize there was a 1.5 scaling in the vertical direction. And so, you know, I do these simulations, you know, run, you know, a few simulations, I go and I show them to, to Eric and the other people we were working with. And, uh, you know, he was excited about them. And he was like, Oh, let's look at the geometry. And I pulled up the geometry. And he was like, that's not right. That's you've skewed uh, the mesh, it's dipping at it's dipping at the wrong angle. Uh, and so I went and fixed that. 
and then uh, quickly realized that uh, I'd misread another part of the figure and put in the material properties wrong. And um, so there's lots of little things that I realized that sort of, you know, when I'm just doing a little computational model on my side and I, I'm setting up the problem, um, that, that that's probably, that, you know, that's pretty straightforward to do. But once you actually begin working with the data, uh, I realized that there's so many, so many places for me, for me to embarrass myself and so many places that I did embarrass myself uh, in front of my colleagues. But once again, um, fortunately, you know, my colleagues are very forgiving, uh, forgiving folks. And, you know, we got it. Well, I think we got it right uh, when, we, when we finally got around to it. But I think that's another reason why, you know, working in these collaborative teams within the earth sciences has been great for me because, you know, having somebody that understands things, looking, in the, looking at things alongside of me is, has really been beneficial. So, I mean, I think that uh, computational scientists can certainly make a huge impact in this field. Uh, and I think that there's lots of open problems there. And I think that um, my best advice that I could give to an aspiring young computational mathematician would be sort of to understand your fundamentals and sort of, you know, um, I actually three years ago didn't know that much about earthquake modeling. Um, but sort of because I had a deep understanding of numerics, of computing, of these sorts of things, I could come in and make an impact. And also, I mean, just having a good uh, physical intuition, not just understanding sort of sort of the mathematics side of things, but getting down in the trenches with, with physicists is important and sort of building those strong collaborations. I mean, I've always been driven by the problems, sort of what are the interesting problems and sort of what are the techniques that I have that I can apply to those problems. And I think uh, for me, I've found personally sort of the area of earth sciences to be an extremely rich field for applied mathematics, especially computational math. There's a lot of really good applied mathematicians uh, within the earth sciences. They think very, very mathematically, um, but there's a there's a big um, push right now within the earth sciences to use computation. And I think that's um, across the board. Um, and I found sort of the earth science community to be an extremely welcoming community uh, to outsiders, extremely welcoming to uh, computational folks. Um, and they know that, you know, going in that you can you can offer something, you have something to bring to the table. And they're really excited to hear about that.